I'm back. My name is Nancy Housel. I am your instructor for today's class. And today's topic is High Seas Adventures. We're going to talk about some adult programming ideas. Um, certainly, uh, these could be adapted for adults of various ages, uh, but also would work for older teens if you're responsible for programming for both uh, older teens and adults. This would these activities I think could apply for that. Uh, I'm a librarian here uh, at KDLA in the Division of Library Services. With me today is Debbie Hibbard. Debbie is also a librarian. She is uh, officially part, uh, one half of the reference section here at uh, KDLA in uh, the Division of Library Services. And so Debbie will be monitoring the uh, the chat box. Uh, somebody's saying they lost sound. Um, so uh, Debbie will alert uh, me to any questions uh, that I might need to respond to. Um, she will also uh, keep watch for any technical problems see where somebody has uh, lost sound, and uh, Debbie is responding to you uh, right now. Um, so hopefully we can get that uh, taken care of pretty quick. Um, you know, uh, my experience uh, employment-wise includes about 15 years of teaching at the middle school and high school levels. Uh, taught at a small rural school in uh, Louisiana. I, the, my classroom was in a building that was built by WPA in the 30s. Uh, if the windows were open on a pretty day. You could hear cows mooing. You could hear chickens clucking because there was a farm that kind of surrounded uh, the end of the school where I was, uh, where my classroom was. Um, so I don't know if uh, programming, you know, touches those same. Uh, things that made teaching uh, a good career for me. Uh, also, I'm a child of uh, two ministers, so you know, did a lot of programming uh, help uh, with my parents in various church activities, and as an adult, uh, did a lot of uh, both child, teen, and adult programming through various church activities. So. I don't know, that, that's just a part of my makeup. So um, I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily creative. You know, I don't think of myself as, you know, thinking out of the box person. But sometimes I have a good idea and I know how to kind of go out there and search for some resources that I can either adapt or borrow uh, in order to uh, create a program around a topic. So with the summer coming on, I thought, you know, when it gets really hot, a lot of us will think about wanting to be on the beach, you know, with some nice ocean breezes, you know, getting away from all the stress of of uh, what goes on at home for a little while, what's going on at work. So I picked uh, the C's as our programming topic. But just to let you uh, know why oceans is an important topic, I've got some facts for you. Okay, so the first fact I've got for you is that the oceans control the Earth's weather because they heat and cool 
provide humidity, uh, winds dry the air, and oceans control wind speed and direction. Okay, so we're all affected by weather, which means we all need to know something about oceans. Okay, so no matter how far from the ocean you live, ocean affects your life and the lives of your patrons. So oceans flow over nearly three-fourths of the planet and contains 97% of all the planet's water. The oceans produce more than half of the oxygen in the atmosphere and absorbs the most carbon dioxide. Okay, so kind of lifeblood there. Um, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, food that we eat, Products that keep us warm, safe, informed, and entertained all come from or are transported over the oceans. Um, marine species provide uh, food, medicine, and is the source of some people's livelihood. You know, think of Deadliest Catch, those uh, that TV series on the Discovery Channel about uh, the guys who fish for crab, people like that. About half of the world's population lives in a coastal zone. And ocean-based businesses contribute more than $500 billion to the world's economy. So this is definitely a resource that we want to take care of. But as you probably know, we've made some choices and decisions in the past where we've put some of that resources at risk. So we want to make sure that we know how to protect the oceans and the marine ecosystems because really our survival depends upon it. Okay, so those are all reasons why oceans are a good topic for a library program even though we may be far removed from the ocean. Now, granted, some uh, things would be a lot easier, you know, if we could, like, point out the window and people could see the ocean. But I think you could kind of broaden the topic to include large bodies of water, whether they be rivers or lakes. Um, I think you would have to, you know, see what your activity was and whether it related to all bodies of water. So uh, just keep that in mind. Okay, so a couple of things before we get down to specific activities. Just want to let you know that, you know, libraries have used ocean, the ocean as a topic for programs before. Here on your slide you can see some posters uh, from either summer readings or other library uh, programs that have something to do with water are the oceans. In fact, I think it was just, what, maybe three summers ago that uh, the summer reading program was all about water. So in doing some research for today's program, I found these slogans are taglines that could be used uh, for a uh, program related to uh, the high seas adventures are um, so it's been done before so I think that's a good sign that we can do it too okay so I'm going to start with uh, talking about display ideas because certainly if you're going to have a program that you're going to invest time and energy and money in, you want to make sure it gets off to a good start. And a good way of doing that is to use all your in-house ways of marketing the idea for your regular customers as well as reaching out to outside sources. But we're going to talk about display ideas, maybe because this feeds into 
my own uh, desire for doing bulletin boards and displays. Um, so uh, here you kind of see uh, an example uh, of what someone did. They kind of used crinkly uh, streamers in order to create, you know, the body of the fish and uh, used kind of the green shiny ribbon or streamers in order to uh, put in like ocean plants. He used a blue background to simulate uh, the ocean. You know, I'm not very artistic. I only lasted one day in art class in high school. Uh, but, you know, this is something if I had the pattern for, I could do this. Okay, so, again, think broad when you're thinking about the seas or the oceans. You know, certainly the first thing we think about is, you know, what books do we have on the topic? Certainly you want to pick a wide selection of both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, you know, you'll have some that, you know, never read nonfiction and vice versa. Some people only read nonfiction. So if you put some out there, hopefully you'll hit uh, uh, someone uh, with something that they'll be interested in. Here's a possibility of topics that you could use that are related to the seas or the oceans. Uh, ships of various kinds, uh, sailing, pirates. Who doesn't love pirates? Uh, sunken treasure. I bet there are a lot of treasures that are unhidden on your library shelves. Marine life, uh, travel guides, uh, things related to the beach and the shoreline, protecting the environment. All of these are good themes for a display in your area. And uh, I picked these uh, two examples on our graphics here because one really goes into it and really kind of created a scene where it looks like you're on the beach in this little reading nook, you know, with the slingback chairs, the fish net on the wall, <coughs> and uh, other things there that um, they call the reader's reef. Um, and then you have this uh, other thing. I guess it's meant to be a jellyfish, maybe, with just some uh, metallic blue ribbon streams going down to represent the legs or arms, and then just kind of a clear plastic bag with some different colored spots on it. Now, if you aren't artistic, you could do this jellyfish. And then you could either hang them from the ceiling or, you know, uh, put it on the wall. Okay, so here are some more examples from kind of uh, more involved. Uh, the one in the upper right hand corner uh, took a big ocean poster and then put out this grid of squares uh, with uh, duct tape and uh, then in the squares they were going to either uh, put titles of books that they were recommending or would put out they were going to uh, somehow involve the patrons in some type of interactive activity and uh, whatever was written or brought in for show and tell was going to be placed in those squares. Take a bite out of a good book, Shark. Uh, this is a bulletin board. Uh, you know, it may look a, uh, some of these are meant for younger classrooms, but I think if you made a uh, more serious looking shark, that would work. Uh, <clears throat> I like this uh, window. This probably looks like more of something that may would go in a bookstore window. But I kind of like the uh, simplicity of kind of using sand, you know, like using kind of the old-fashioned cat litter as a substitute for sand, and then uh, putting in books uh, related to sea creatures or mermaids. Um, <clears throat> on the uh, other corner, we've got kind of an underwater scene with uh, some uh, Nemo-looking type uh, 
fish and some other sea creatures. And then you could put up uh, either book jackets or some other type of um, indication of titles that you might want to highlight. Here you can see display using props, some life preservers. Uh, here's the, my fish again. I really like this, this shark thing. <coughs> I could see where it would be a really cute photo op. You know, you make, you make this big fish and then have people in your program. If you did a program on sharks, then everybody could have a photo opportunity so it looks like they were being eaten by a shark. Think uh, this octopus kind of around a wall would be a great idea if you were doing an involved program in a meeting room. Certainly would kind of set off a good tone. And here's one based on pirates, books to treasure. You've got a treasure chest and uh, the pirate there. And then in the chest, you could put, you know, the things uh, that you want to highlight from your collection along with a few props on the outside. Okay, so just a couple of reminders on DVDs. Make sure, uh, make sure you think beyond books, so include DVDs. These could be, you know, documentary type things that you have in collection about marine life, about the oceans, about the environment. Certainly you could uh, use uh, movie DVDs where the action takes place mostly on the sea or near a beach. Um, you know, don't be shy about using props that you may uh, be able to borrow from other people on the staff or that you may have yourself. Just remember sometimes Props, one large one, can be better than a lot of little things. Um, and uh, another thing that you might consider adding to your display besides book are CDs of songs about seafaring life or music that comes uh, from uh, the surfing culture. Um, okay, here are just a couple of more. Might think I am going crazy here, but I like I like this. So uh, here you kind of see where they used a corner to kind of set up a uh, kind of uh, ocean. I, I'm sure they used something like uh, art paper or bulletin board paper that you can buy at a school supply place to create those waves, and then <coughs> either used cutouts or uh, made the fish to hang on the wall. The Rider's Reef, you know, an ocean poster, a fish net, where you, you could probably buy at a party supply store, and then they just attached a uh, fish to it. Another big uh, uh, marine life scene in the lower right hand corner, left hand corner. And I liked, I picked this uh, one on the right hand corner because I like the, remember I was telling you sometimes bigger is better. You know, I like the idea of the surfboards. That certainly would draw someone's interest to the um, display and might uh, cause someone uh, to take something from the display and check it out. <coughs> Uh, before we move on, let me just give you a couple of reminders about a good display, whether it's on a bulletin board or in a case. Remember, it's not what you like, but what you think will appeal to your customers or your patrons. So you want to make sure that you choose things that look fresh. Now, if you've used the same prop for 10 years, it might be time to make a new one or a new poster. Now you want whatever you put up there, you want it to look fresh, appealing, uh, and in good condition. You want something that is eye-catching. You know, every display, every bulletin board needs to have a title. Um, be careful about uh, putting in too much. You want some white space. 
Um, you want to make sure that you don't use too many words. You know, what I read is that if you have to use like a sentence or a paragraph to explain what's going on, then you've got need to rethink it. It's too long. Um, use cardstock over construction paper for signs and for uh, for patterns. Use bright, bold colors over neon and glitter. If you're using the computer to make your sign or banner, choose a simple, readable font over something that's, you know, intricate and hard to read. The idea of the display, especially if it's on a table, is that people, you want people to be able to pick up a book or CD or DVD to check out. So if that's not clear, you know, with whatever you're displaying, you need to add a sign to that so they know it's okay to take something off, off the table or ask for something out of the display case. That way you can just take one uh, something else and uh, refresh the display. You can add uh, extra value by uh, putting bookmarks or a suggested reading list or staff pick list or something like that near your display. Okay. So let's move on. Oh, I got here's some more. Um, I know some of these are a little busy for me, uh, but I do like the one with the streamers kind of twisted, different shades of blue, or of what color the ocean would be, kind of twisted, you know, up and down with the fish kind of inserted. Now, see, I think that would be easy to do on a wall. You wouldn't necessarily. You would just have to be tall in order to get, get that done. Okay, so let's talk about community sponsors. Now, last night, while waiting for the UK baseball game to start, I opened up a fortune cookie. And the fortune was... Uh, the plan is not as important as the planning. And I thought, I need to remember that for tomorrow. Because this is one area where planning is super, super, super important. Now, you may be in a large library where you have an actual programming budget. You know, that you have a set budget and you know, that you can parcel it out to buy supplies or materials that you might need for programs throughout the year. Some of you, however, may be from very small areas or small counties or poor areas where you don't have a lot of money, period. And what you have to work with is either very small or something that you have to generate funding for out of your own pocket or find a partner or a sponsor in the community. So this is definitely something that requires some preparation because you don't want to go out asking for support either you know for uh, purchasing prizes or sponsoring an event without having your approach set uh, and uh, deciding, you know, is it best to approach this person by a letter, you know, in person, you know, is there somebody on the, on the uh, governing board that has an in road with the, the person or the business that I'm looking at asking for help? Uh, is there somebody in the friends group that has a contact that would be helpful? You know, when you approach somebody about supporting or making a donation, you want to make sure you know statistics, uh, what the connections are between that business 
and the population that comes to your library, the people that you're trying to reach out to by having this program. You want to be able to provide them information about your library and what being involved with you can do to benefit their organization. So you always want to play, you know, the fact that, you know, this shows that they can be good neighbors. And always, always, always in capital letters, exclamation point, send a handwritten thank you note for any business that agrees to be a sponsor or a partner for your program. Now, <clears throat> here I just sat down and as I made activities, I said, now what kind of business would either donate a prize for this or would donate materials like for craft item or might donate money, you know, to pay for a speaker or what, you know, whatever. So you can see I came up with a pretty long list. Now, granted, not all communities have all these things, but certainly a lot of, of communities, uh, you know, would have access to uh, a, a lot of these. Uh, even if you live near a state park that has a big lake, you know, like, you know, you probably have, you know, boat shops, boat equipment, boat repair places. I mean, I think even though they aren't specifically related to the ocean, I think it, there's certainly something that you might uh, reach out to. The State Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, certainly uh, can go across statewide. Uh, Kentucky Parks Department, uh, the state parks, uh, a lot of them have lakes for water activities. Your local water utility, most of those usually have an educational department where they will provide, you know, brochures or may have DVDs or uh, have some type of traveling experiment or display. Uh, thing that you could uh, use for a program on protecting the oceans, protecting the environment. So again, uh, some of these I added because they could serve as a possibility for a guest speaker. I put dermatologist on here, you know, big thing about the summers, protecting your skin, not getting too overexposed because you want to protect your skin from uh, uh, you know, aging because of too much sun, the whole thing about skin cancer, you know, about, you know, what you should look for in a sun tanning lotion or sun tanning oil. I mean, a dermatologist uh, in your community uh, or from the hospital certainly could be a guest speaker you might could call on to come and do something like that. And then you could go to your local Walmart and ask them to you know, donate some uh, things related to skin care or protection from the sun. Okay, so just know that there's a lot out there. You know, you just kind of have to cast your net, so to speak. Okay, so when thinking about the activities, I thought of things that could serve well for a standalone program as well as activities that you could string together over a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And so if you're going to do something that's more than standalone, then you might want to consider doing some type of game board or progress sheet or something similar to what you use probably for summer reading. Now these were just some general ones that I found out there by searching Pinterest in Google. So here's a summer reading bingo and it's kind of a generic and essentially you know there are tasks for your patron to do and you know he marks off or she marks off the ones they do and then based on whatever goal you set in terms of making bingo or filling in the card you know they could win a prize which 
you know, could be donated by one of your sponsors. Uh, I thought this one, Summer Reading Bucket List, was kind of cute. Uh, again, it's kind of on a summer reading travel theme. And again, each line has a task or type of task to be completed. Uh, summer Reading Challenge is just uh, kind of like a checklist. Again, um, it's not so much follow the exact example, but kind of the type of thing that you could do. You know, um, read an ebook. You know, a comic book could be a graphic book. You know, and you could make these have something to do with water. In, you know, if, if you're going to do that theme over several months. Here are some example of game boards. Uh, what you see on the left there is a game board based on the idea of a passport. So um, this is printed. So every participant in your program get would get the passport and a sheet of badges. And so when they do the task that's on the badge, like read a book, read an ebook, watch a DVD, and so forth, then they tape it or glue it into their passport. And so uh, when they fill in the passport, then they get a prize. Uh, you could do a map. Uh, here are a couple of examples. Uh, you could, uh, on the top one, the world map, uh, you may not be able to tell from the picture but it has routes of like explorers or ocean currents on it. And so the idea is that you know you put this up in your uh, library and give each person you know a ship magnet or uh, some some type of thing. And as they progress through a list of activities, they would uh, advance their course around the world. Uh, on the bottom one is kind of the same thing, except this is primarily within the United States. And that is, you have have these different ribbons, either uh, reflecting highways or pa or roads that pass near major uh, lakes and things within the United States. And the idea is you give them a car or something, and as they progress around through the different tasks that you set in your game or contest, then they would advance their marker. Okay, here's the fun part. Program activities. Okay, so the easiest thing is to have a movie night based around the seas or the oceans. Now, I guess I'm showing my age when I say you could do a Frank and Annette, Frankie and Annette Beach Movie Marathon. Okay, now if you remember watching these in the movies yourself, then congratulations. You are probably a baby boomer like me. But if you're too young and you don't know what I'm talking about, Frankie Avalon and Annette Finicello were in a series of movies in the 1960s that you know was really popular with uh, teens at that time, and they called them beach party movies. That's the genre. So the storyline was pretty simple. You had a very you know good innocent boy and girl are in love, you know, in a very wholesome way, and along the way they encounter some threat from the outside. Um, you know, to their world, which, you know, pretty much centers around the beach. So, you know, either there's an adult villain, you know, that's going to take away the beach, or, you know, there's a handsome uh, guy that comes along and tries to steal away the girl, or, you know, a hot-looking young uh, lady who comes by and tries to steal the guy. Okay, so, you know, Throw in that kind of simple plot line. Throw in some songs by famous artists of the time. Throw in a little bit of slapstick comedy, you know, and you get a movie that, you know, while you may not have learned anything, people found them entertaining. 
So you could introduce a whole new generation of people to those uh, uh, beach party boobies. Now, you can go out there on the internet, <clears throat> you can Google, you know, top ocean themed movies, and you will find GAD's uh, list out there. Now, one of the first ones I found was what I included on the slide. The reason why I picked it, because it was kind of a mixture of more modern and classic as well. So this particular list said Captain's Courageous, which is from 1937. So this is an adaptation of Rudyard Kipling's work of the same title. And this was really uh, uh, well received because of the action sequences it had and for the uh, heartfelt story about the relationship between an overprivileged and bratty young boy and a humble, common fisherman. Sort of a coming-of-age story. Master and Commander, uh, this is the one from 2003 with Russell Crowe. Again, this is an adaptation of a series of books about Captain Lucky Jack Aubrey, uh, who commands the British... Uh, Warship Surprise. Um, so he's pursuing a French privateer uh, in the movie. And this movie's known for the scenes of the Galapagos Islands, a very breathtaking cinematography, uh, also for the realistic depiction of field surgery, and uh, for telling about what trends the ocean transoceanic sailing was like during the Age of Discovery. Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearls, another modern uh, choice here. Uh, this is uh, a course about Captain Jack Sparrow who helps Will Turner rescue his uh, sweetheart from zombie pirates. Um, the Bounty, this is the 1984 version with Mel Gibson. It tells the story of the mutiny on the Bounty where Fletcher Christian, which is played by Mel Gibson, uh, leads a mutiny against um, Lieutenant Bly, played by Anthony Hopkins. And uh, so it tells how that comes about and also tells how Bly and the men who were kicked off the ship uh, made it to safety in a tiny lifeboat. Damn the Defiant uh, is about the HMS British ship Defiant during the French Revolutionary War. Uh, here we have a fair-minded Captain Crawford who is locked in a battle against a cruel second in command and uh, the fight between the two and the cruelty of the second in command leads the crew to mutiny. Okay, so lots of options there. I came across one list said, you know, top movies uh, destined to scare you, you know, about the ocean. Uh, you could probably do 10 top, top movies about sharks. You know, there's a lot out there to pick from. Just a caution that whatever you choose, make sure you are uh, covered for viewing with your public performance rights. Okay, you certainly could do something that's just for fun. So one of the things I came across was just doing a fun night uh, based on pirates. Now, what I've got on the slide here is some places you can go for uh, resources in terms of decorating, in terms of paper games that you could do. Uh, we have a pirate bowling game. The link there would take you to uh, an explanation of the game and uh, a list of supplies. But since you take a child's bowling game and it gives you some suggestions on how to set it up so it looks like, you know, 
you're bowling along a pirate's plank, and of course, you know, whoever knocks down the most pins, you know, gets the prize. I uh, came across the Swab the Deck Relay Race. Now, in programs that I've done here at the agency, I haven't had much luck getting people up to do kind of relay races and stuff. You might have better luck depending upon the age of your crowd. But it's simply it's taking a broom or a deck mop and uh, having them move a ping pong ball through a obstacle course, you know, made with traffic cones or some other type of seafaring, you know, shells or uh, items. And of course, you know, you go through, uh, <coughs> push the ping pong ball around, you know, the item, and then you come back, and you know, whatever team gets done first, you know, wins. So again, the idea is there are lots out there that you can turn to. You don't necessarily have to think of all this on your own. Um, the decoration side, which comes from a website called Party Swizzle, I mean, it has about, it probably has what would be multiple pages of decorating tips from small spaces to large spaces, you know, suggestions of, of what to do to make a pirate costume. Uh, what to do if you want to make a treasure chest, uh, you know, uh, where to go to look for uh, music that would match the mood. Uh, so again, something where you're not necessarily looking to teach anybody or to stir anybody to action, you're just having fun. This would be a great thing to do on, you know, national you know, speak pirate, you know, day, which I think is somewhere, I want to say in the fall, spring, you know, I, I know it's not in the summer. Okay, so one thing I thought about was looking at sea songs. <coughs> now, there are specific kinds of sea songs. The first one is uh, shanties. Shanties are work songs that are used on, you know, the big sailing ships. And the rhythm of the song coordinated to whatever task was being done. So there are long ones for longer tasks, shorter ones for short tasks. Um, of course, not used much anymore today since, <coughs> you know, most of our uh, commercial vessels you know, don't use uh, sails or don't require uh, men to, you know, haul rigging and that sort of thing. But they still are popular among folk musicians. So you've got sea shanties. You also got other uh, songs about life on the sea. Uh, just about any song with a regular beat, you know, could be used to synchronize the work on a ship. So you can go out there and uh, find lyrics to many, many songs about life on the sea. Now, certainly if you don't have any of these in your CD music collection already, I'm certain you could find some on YouTube or you could find others that you could download for a small fee through iTunes. Uh, you certainly, uh, if you could ILL a CD or something, you could find list of uh, specific uh, CDs that you could request uh, by just uh, doing Google. So you certainly could talk, do programs about examples of these type of sea songs. You know, you can encourage people to sing along. Uh, you could do use. Uh, the titles or lyrics of the songs for guessing games or matching game. Certainly, if you have a folk singer in your area or uh, a choir teacher in your area might be willing to come and help uh, with uh, and do a performance of some of these songs. Okay, so our next activity 
is uh, more of an educational program. Um, you know, I thought about deep sea diving. You know, if you're in a large enough community where you have a deep sea diving shop, you certainly could have somebody come and explain the equipment. Uh, Mike could do a field trip, you know, where you go to where there's a pool, you know, so people could kind of experience uh, some of this. Um, but even in a uh, regular meeting room setting, <coughs> I came across this educational activity that is meant for school age children, but certainly I think you could uh, do it uh, with adults as well. The idea is to talk about the principle that in order to deep sea dive, there needs to be buoyancy. And so you kind of talk about the scientific principle of buoyancy. <coughs> which, you know, buoyancy is a word that refers to your ability to float. And so <coughs> the link that you see on the slide uh, is a link to an entire lesson plan from introduction, you know, all the way to evaluation that you could customize or adapt to a program of adults. So essentially what you're doing is uh, it starts off by uh, taking some objects and asking them, you know, what do you think will float, what won't? And then thinking about, you know, what, what kinds of properties are needed in order for something to float. And that, that uh, leads to a discussion on the principle of buoyancy. And so the, the big activity here is you divide your uh, attendance uh, at the program into groups and you have materials available and you encourage them to make a three by three inch deep sea diver out of the materials that you provide and you ask them to design this diver and then what you're eventually going to do is have them test to see if they've created a diver that will float in a bucket of water. And then, you know, if it doesn't work and there's time, then you can ask them to go back and, and twist or tweak their design uh, to see if they can make it float or at least have a discussion about, you know, what didn't go right. And there's a suggestion for follow-up activities, too, that you might could use. All right, this is kind of a uh, broader idea of water in general, but this is kind of based kind of more on an environmental or uh, being a safe consumer or user of water. Uh, the idea behind this program is just to see how we use water and aware of uh, where we see water, how much we use water, how important it is to conserve water. So here you would invite a guest from your local water system or somebody involved uh, in uh, water industry like a plumber, a treatment plant employee, and essentially you're just asking them to share, you know, something about their job, you know, what we need to do in order to overcome any concerns about protecting the environment. And encourage them to bring anything with them that would help them explain the kinds of things they do, maybe things they could use to, uh, you know, clean water from the tap or uh, items they could do or activities they could do to conserve water at home. I think sometimes that gets to be a problem in the summer when there isn't a lot of rainfall you know, some communities kind of have drought and then they go to where, you know, they don't allow watering except on certain days of the week or not at all or, you know, I can remember times in Lexington where that's been true. Um, you can ask the participants to keep a journal or a water use log, you know, so they can see where they might need to start to uh, uh, conserve use of water. Now this is about things like letting the water run while you're brushing your teeth uh, or, you know, washing, uh, using the shower, you know, turning off the water while you soap up, you know, things of that sort. 
Um, and of course, discussing all the ways there are to conserve water. OK, now here's one. It looks like uh, Adobe Connect, uh, I guess, bunched this, the uh, picture there up on the text. But I don't think it's like that way in your handout. But, you know, who doesn't like to talk about food? Now, in this case, use uh, seafood as a basis for your program. You know, talk about the nutritional values of using seafood over red meat. Uh, you know, have a cooking demonstration done by a local chef. You'll want to check with your local health department to make sure you meet all those conditions. Mysteries at sea. How about a program on the Bermuda Triangle? Our uh, legend of a ghost ship, the Flying Dutchman. Now, certainly these are all programs of interest. Using a treasure hunt. Now, this activity I found was more about introducing new patrons to different services in your library or different resources in your library. So it's kind of more like a scavenger hunt where they don't really find loot per se, but you're giving them clues that would help them discover, you know, different uh, parts of your collections or different collections in your library. Uh, how about programs on whales? Um, you, I, when I went out to find information, uh, I found everything from a simple pattern to make an origami whale. Um, I found programs about conserving the whale population. And I put two choices here because I thought they were kind of extreme to a point. There's a series on Animal Planet called Whale Wars, which talks about ships who go out and try to foil the works of Japanese whaler, whaling ships. You know, they have all these different activities they try in order to keep them from killing whales. I put Star Trek for, yes, my family was a Trekker family, but my favorite is Star Trek movie four, which is about uh, going back into the past to get humpback whales and bring them to the future because they've become extinct in the future and uh, other humpback whales, I guess, from another solar system have come to figure out what happened to our whales. And so they need these whales in order to save the world. Uh, whale communication, I think this just, uh, you know, this program essentially is you do a short program about how whales communicate, how they find their way in an ocean uh, when they have poor eyesight and things are pretty murky under the water. And then the pod squad is an activity where essentially you use the sound of people's voices to try to figure out who the people are or where they are in the room. Whale song. Uh, you know, certainly you could do this uh, as a means of whale uh, communication, or you could just certainly do it as a follow-up activity to a documentary about whales. You know, you could have people describe, you know, what they feel when they hear the music, uh, or you know, they could you know, draw lines on paper, you know, and choose colors and you know direction of lines based on how the music makes them feel. See, pretty simple. And whale song, you can find lots of that on the internet or on YouTube. Uh, I was looking for a hands-on activity besides the origami whale. I came across this one called Blubber Glove Activity. Now, this is an activity to show how the blubber of a whale keeps them warm, especially in Arctic conditions. So very simple activity just uh, requires a large quart size paper, plastic bags, I mean, a can of Crisco, a bucket of wa ice water, and then you need towels. 
So essentially, you go through the process and you make yourself a glove based on your own hand, and then you uh, test by putting your bare hand in cold water, see how long it lasts, and then putting on this blubber glove and then seeing how much longer you can keep your hand in the water. Um, let's see. The Titanic. I don't know what it is about the Titanic, but, you know, we all love the Titanic. You know, there are lots of video clips, documentaries uh, out there on the Titanic. Um, you know, you can look at the, the passengers from famous to the immigrants uh, who were in steerage. You could look at it from a technological aspect on why the ship that, that could not sink actually sunk. You, know, you could look at the myths and you know the, the fact and fiction of the Titanic. Um, for a more educational look, uh, you could uh, do uh, look at newspaper coverage. There's a site based from the Library of Virginia that looks at coverage both from an international and national aspect of what was sensationalized, what was reported that turned out to be wrong. Um, so you could look at that. Uh, you could compare movie treatments of the disaster. You see there are three there to choose from. Um, and a couple of games to test knowledge of the Titanic. We are running out of time. Let's see. Victory at Sea uh, is a documentary about naval warfare in World War II. Uh, I can remember my father having the soundtrack for this. Uh, he was a hi-fi buff. So this might be something that would appeal to men, especially uh, any veterans that you might have from that era. You could uh, do see some of the episodes which are available online uh, in YouTube or or you could pay uh, you could play some of the music and have them share some of their experiences. Hands-on activities. Um, you could do model ships. You could have uh, teach them how to tie knots. You could learn about uh, sending messages by semaphore or Morse code. Um, there are activities that you can find online where you take a pillowcase and make your own naval or nautical flag. This is a simple poem, kind of a five-line poem that you can make. Does involve rhyming, which is the hardest part about people writing poetry, but look how simple. Here's one on penguins. And each is set in, each line has to do a certain thing. So you start off with your subject, two words descriptive, three ing words, a phrase that describes penguin in this case, and then another word for penguin. Now, a great, great thing that you could post on the wall or on your social media. Twitter tales, essentially is researching a nautical legend or myth and creating modern Twitter tales in order to retell the story or facts about whatever is being researched. Myth and Legends, we kind of covered that. S navigating by stars, certainly this is something you could do in the evening and use all your amateur astronomers to help uh, find those constellations. Here are some craft ideas. Here are the links for things that you see here. So you can make these knotted tie coasters. Take an old mirror and repurpose it to the nautical theme, or using rope uh, to repurpose a lamp that has a round base. So these are the pictures that go along with the links on the previous page. Here are some more. I put these because I thought these were relatively simple and inexpensive. You know, you could make jars that have a sea theme. Uh, the blue things in the corner are coffee filters with uh, C-shaped silhouettes. Uh, this is kind of a beach uh, 
keepsake jar that you do with items uh, from a previous vacation. Here is a wreath that you make using a burlap cloth and starfish on a wire ring. Okay, activity sheets, you can make them up yourselves or you can find them online. All you need to do is go to Google your friend. And here are a bunch of other topics that we didn't even, you know, I didn't even try to cover. Uh, but again, a lot of source of things I think people would be interested in that you could develop a similar program around. Okay, so I just want to remind you that we're here to help you in any way that we can. You could reach us by phone or you could use the Ask a Librarian request. We want you to remember to check the training events calendar.